Hello everyone and welcome to American Civil War and UK History. I'm Daz. This presentation is available as a video on our YouTube channel or as a podcast from wherever you get your podcast from. And joining me today is friend and historian Mark Wheatcroft from Mark's English English History Channel. Welcome, Mark. Hi, uh, Darren. Good to see you again. And historian Alex, the history guy who has an Instagram page as well as a YouTube channel which we'll discuss at the end of the discussion. Welcome, Alex. Yellow. And uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, King John and the First Baron, Baron's War. And uh, there's quite a lot to it, so we'll get started. Um, so let's start with uh, King John's early life. So he's the fourth son of Henry II, um, the first king of the Plantagenet dynasty, and his wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine. So these are two of the most important people in European royalty. Um, Eleanor is actually the divorced wife of the King of France, and they get married whilst Henry is still Henry of Anjou. Um, he hasn't actually become Henry II yet, being that he is the daughter, the son of the deposed Queen Empress Matilda. So she was deposed by Stephen on the death of her father, Henry the First, um, the son of William, the youngest son of William the Conqueror. So it's a real dynastic policy thing here going on. So they get married um, when he's heir apparent to England, waiting Stephen's death. Once Stephen dies, Henry becomes Henry the King of England, Henry the Second. And at this point, so at this point, John is the fourth son, he's the favourite son of Henry, being that he's the one that he can sort of have fun with in terms of he's not ever seen as going to be a king. Um, that is going to go, first of all, to his eldest son, Henry, who's also known as the Young King. And then... Unfortunately, he dies whilst rebelling against his father, and we end up with Richard the Lionheart, Richard the First, as the successor of Henry the Second, who is John's oldest brother. Now, with we, as we know, with Richard, he goes off. He has a ten-year reign in England. He goes off on crusade. Returning from the crusade, is is captured in Austria, which we then have to rents pay a ransom for, which almost bankrupts the country in doing so. And in the, in the intervening years that he's been on, he's captured, the King of France is taking back lands from the English slash Plantagenet em, Empire, the Plantagenet Empire, shall we call it. Um, this consists of not only lands in England, but in Normandy, in Anjou, in Maine, in um, Aquitaine as well. So pretty much stretching from Hadrian's Wall in the North all the way down to the Pyrenees. Okay, so John in his young years was also known as John Lackland because he wasn't given any land. In fact, he's only really given one prominent piece of land to control which was the castle at Chinon. Now, Chinon was one of the most major important strategic castles in this Plantagenet Empire, and it actually the gifting of the castle to John rather than to his oldest brother, Henry, is one of the reasons that his oldest brother rebels against his father. This rebellion, it's huge, um, so we're not going to touch on it today because we could actually just do a whole podcast on this rebellion alone, but it involves all the sons and the wife against Henry. So it's really quite a big, major, big event. But unlike Richard, who was gifted Aquitaine by his mother to control at an early age and learned lordship, John, be it having had this nickname Blackland, didn't have any feudal lands to control. So when he actually becomes king, he then... Lose he, he hasn't got that experience behind him of controlling large pieces of land. So he's got the he then gets the largest of all the lands, and as a result, 
he doesn't really know what to do with it, uh, which leads to a lot of issues in both not only England but also in the land in France that uh, that are still in control of the Plantagenet Dick family by the time that John is king. Because when uh, Richard died, when Richard dies in France, and the name of the castle escapes me now, but he was besieging it to try and take it back when he was sh- shot by a crossbowman. And that is where, um, that that's a brief overview of, of his early life. Okay, cool. And Alex, I know you want to talk a little bit about King Richard uh, the Lionheart. Don't you? So tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, of course. Um, so again, possibly thanks to Disney, um, when you read about like just brief histories of him, I'll say who's just you know brave, courageous king, a really good warlord as well. He's a really good military leader. Um, yeah, fair enough. He was just a military leader. He was not a king. Um, he was a king in name, but not by right, really, because he didn't actually act as a king. Um, actively, he didn't care uh, about politics. He didn't even like England. He never spent any time here at all, um, just coming over whenever he politically had to, um, basically forced to by the people who were actually ruling the country and they needed his appearance. Um, other than that, he was perfectly happy living out his days in France and also going on crusades. That's the only thing he really cared about. Now, um Obviously, that's not cheap. Crusades are not cheap. Uh, the Pope is very happy with it um, because they help fund it, but it's still extremely expen- uh, expensive. And that was just bleeding the coffers dry. So pretty much King John, regardless of what, how he was going to act, he already had a, an extremely difficult job ahead of him. I mean, it's kind of, you know, again, I'm not a very political person nowadays, but obviously you see in British politics nowadays, no one really wanted to become you know, the next prime minister because of the state where the previous politicians had left the country. So there was so much, so many issues for King John to clear up. Um, he was kind of doomed at the start. Now, um, as Mark alluded to as well, when he got uh, attacked by a crossbowman, this is also one of like the main points to take home uh, and remember with the reign of King, uh, King Richard. So, as the story goes, now again, stories going back this far, you really got to look to who actually recorded these. This story is recorded by multiple people and apparently some eyewitnesses. But again, you really need to you know, dig deep and kind of just use your own mind whether you can actually completely believe them or not. Um, but it said that there was... So he was walking around the castle during the siege. He was checking out the sappers uh, who were currently in the process of building tunnels and mines uh, underneath the walls to bring them down. Now, he was inspecting this with some of the um, the military commanders, and then a crossbowman took a pop shot at him um, from the castle walls. He It missed, and reportedly he actually applauded the crossbowman for his attempt at his life. And, you know, seeing it saying the, the, the British, well, I guess for him, the French equivalent of jolly good shot. Um, it was then when he was acting this way, he was actually shot by another crossbowman, a boy, um, who, yeah, held a crossbow, shot down, actually shot him in the leg. Um, no, he was brought back to his uh, military tent in the camp. And that's where he was actually bed bound. And that became his deathbed. He got, uh, got gangrene. Uh, from his injuries and the story goes one of two ways and i'll let you believe which one you want to because it's really impossible to judge which one is actually correct um story number one which he liked to tell people um was that while on his deathbed he asked for because he was actually told that the siege had been completed it was a success now, he was reportedly told this, and they also said, oh, we've actually captured the boy who shot you. He's confessed to it. Now, he apparently said, okay, bring him into a tent. It was when he was brought into the tent that he forgave him, wished him all the best in his life, and said he would have done the same, and then gave him 100 shillings and then said, be on your way. Um that obviously portrays him in a very courageous light, um, something that evidently a story may have been used when writing the story of Robin Hood when talking about King Richard. Um, there's an alternative story that came out at the same time, 
saying that he said all this and then apparently said, you know, spread the word, like, you know, a good news media coverage for me, one thing I do good before I die. Um, he then pulled one of his guards to the side and said, take that hundred shillings off that person and uh, murder him. And apparently that's what they did. As soon as he got out of the tent, he was brutally murdered by the guards, uh, by the king's guard. And then obviously the hundred uh, shillings was uh, taken back to the coffer. Again, as I say, believe that as much as you think that you do need to believe it. Uh, I'll let you believe whichever story you think would be more accurate. Um, because again, you know, you've always got to be wary of smear campaigns as well as campaigns, you know, uh, news stories that make these people sound, you know, so righteous and kingly as I'm sure they would like to. Um, I personally would believe in the latter story simply because it's no, um, it's no mystery of the atrocities that he committed during the crusade when he was on them. Um, you know, at places like uh, Jaffa, for example, and uh, there's a few other places as well, which I can't remember right off the top of my head at the moment. Um, but he committed atrocities. Atrocities. He used to like beheading uh, citizens um, and uh, prisoners of war. Um, again, reportedly, this is only too much that you can gain as truth from records that go and dating back this far back, because you usually don't know who wrote them. So it's you know, it's always good to take it with a pinch of salt, really. Um, but yes, yeah, so I say when he died, uh, King John was just put in a terrible state where he looked at the coffers, they were bled dry. The Pope was hungry for more and more crusades, saying, I'll, I'll help you support them if you do this for me. Um, the French at this time were continuing with the uh, crusades. So they're already in the Pope's good books. And King John was looking at his finances and thinking, OK, I have possible war in the north with Scotland. I have possible war. Um, uh, or a possible uprising in Ireland. Um, I have the Prince of Gwynedd, um from Wales uh, apparently trying to um, commit an uprising as well. And I've still got the war that I'm now taking over from the French states as well. Not to mention the Pope is rather unhappy with me at this current moment in time because I can't commit to another crusade, which is still ongoing. Um so yeah, uh, safe to say he was given quite a bad, bad hand straight away. However, it is also good to note as well. So I don't want to be, I don't want to be seen as one of those people who says that you know King John couldn't do anything wrong. Um, he had had issues in the past, and actually, when um, the king died on the sixth of April, eleven ninety nine, um, that wasn't King John's first attempt at taking the throne. Um, while, I can't remember the date of that, unfortunately, which is a shame, but uh, while Richard was in the Holy Lands while on crusade, um, King John actually tried to usurp the throne from him, actually trying to get some of uh, the support from France. And he actually got the king's support at the time, the king of France support. However, this support wasn't strong enough and he uh, his uh, attempt at usurping the throne was unfortunately um, it didn't work out. Um, this actually forced King Richard to come back to England on one of the rare attempts he did step foot on English soil. And even though he had already been, uh, so King John had already been banished from England for his actions by the people who were currently controlling the throne in England while um, King Richard was away, when King Richard came back, he actually... Uh, unbanished him and said you can come back to England and apparently thanked him. Uh, he was quite impressed with uh, his ambition to take the, the throne because let's face it he didn't want it anyway. He was possibly looking for an excuse to no longer be the King of England because he just was not interested in it at all. Um, so actually with this, this was the time when he was officially made the, uh, the, the heir to the throne when King Richard died. He put that all in place in writing when he came back to England. Uh, and then, so of course, in 1199, when he did die, that's when King John uh, became king. Okay, cool. And there uh, was... Sorry, Mark. Uh, also, there is actually another person involved in this, and this is his nephew, the son of his elder the, the elder brother but it's the one between Richard and so it's the third brother um uh Jeffrey um his name was Arthur Arthur Brittany and Prince Arthur, yes yeah so there is 
a suggestion that at the last minute that Richard may have changed his mind and put Arthur as heir. Um, but what happened is, uh, at the time of Richard's death is that there's this midnight ride by William Marshall, who is someone we're going to hear a lot of. He's probably the ultimate power behind the Plantagenets. If you look at all of the history of the uh, of the Plantagenet kings, if we of Henry the Second, Richard the First, um, John, and then. Uh, Henry the Third, uh, who come uh, John's son, who will come after him. He's the one who holds them up. What well, well, whilst they've got his support, they are fine. And he makes this midnight ride to Rouen um, on, on the new when when Richard's death to discuss with the Archbishop of Canterbury, who is in position at Rouen at the time. Who actually should we back to be king? Because obviously, with Marshall's power whoever he backs is kind of going to be, be king. And they decide to they go with John because Prince Arthur is just too young. So it's a bit like when we when we looked at the Hastings video about um, Edgar Affleck, where he's just, he's too young, he's not going to have the control. It needs the, the adult hand. Um, but, event, but he's always in the background for, for an early part until... Um, he basically, John, which we'll probably come on to in a moment, bit more in detail, but John manages to secure secure the kingdom for, for a little bit. And it, one of his first major tests is that Arthur, with the support of Philip II of France, rebels and attempts to, and actually captures John's mother, Eleanor, and he, his own grandmother. Um, John defeats this rebellion, captures Arthur, puts him in prison for quite some time. But whilst he's still in prison, he's still able to pull strings, gain support um, as being in prison. So there's this attempted botched mutilation of him, um, which was to see him blinded and castrated whilst he's in prison in Falais Castle, birthplace of William the Conqueror. Uh, the commander of the castle doesn't go through with it he doesn't think it's right um so he's then brought to ruan castle where john is in residence and according to the sources again like i said we always have to touch these with a pinch of salt john one night gets drunk and goes and brutally murders him and then throws him in the river in the same with a with a rock tied to him so it just goes to show that John could act Rufus, like he has got that Plantagenet Rufus streak running through him. He He's a tyrant, but some of these stories, after they come later to back up the tyrancy ideas about him, it's always a little, when we're looking at stuff so long ago, it's always a bit hard to work out. But certainly, even if it, it, even if it was tyrancy in that sense, We've seen it time and time again, and most of these kings get the get get the name of tyrant added to them because of it. But when there's a when there's a challenger to the phone, and it's a young challenger, there's a simple way of dealing. With it. And you see John do it with Arthur. You see Richard do it with princes in the tower. They 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 just they have to die because to to maintain your grip on power, you can't have a challenger. And so that's going to happen time and time again throughout the medieval period. It's, it's a different period that this stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about John's reign. So um, there's some important things going on, like uh, Alex said, about uh, he's taken on a lot of stuff uh, that has uh, come from uh, Richard's reign. But um, talk a little bit about uh, one of the main reasons, obviously, is the lost territory in France. So talk about that, please, Alex. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so again, this is one of the things where it seems that in almost every scenario and situation that happened in King John's reign and his life in general, he was dealt a bad hand, but in some cases he unfortunately did also make it worse himself. 
Um, which, to be fair, I mean, again, there are some things where you look at it and think, okay, there's no way he could have possibly known this kind of thing, or he didn't have a choice. Um, as Mark alluded to, uh, you know, the, the allegedly killing of Prince Arthur. Um, now, Prince Arthur was actually, so yes, he was a possible contender to the throne. He was a threat to the crown, um, as far as John was concerned. Um, however, again, he may have known this, he may have not, he may have just acted in kind of cold blood or, you know, hot headedness and just didn't think about all the possibilities. Obviously, you know, playing the Game of Thrones is like playing chess. Um, you can't really think of how one move now is going to affect you in an hour's, you know, an hour's time or in their time, a generation's time down the line. Um, Prince Arthur did actually have a lot of friends in high places in France. Uh, in the various states and city states of France. So obviously, once news came about that uh, Prince Arthur had been either just died or been killed, um, this unfortunately um, worsened uh, his um, uh, his relationship with the fr French states even more. So again, they are already um, under threat because of the ongoing war and the lack of money to back it up. Um, but then, of course, yes, he did make it worse by making incorrect decisions. Um, it was also to be said as well that, unlike John, King Richard was basically French. Um, at this time, France was not a country like you think it is today. As you can see from the map, it was all split up in different uh, reigns and uh, territories. Now, because... Um, King Richard was pretty much French at this time. It was much easier for uh, different French barons to align with him and to agree trade rights with him and, you know, to agree with uh, uh, sitting on his side, so to speak. King John was very different. Uh, he spent most of his time in England instead, in the large banquet halls and um, parading around the various royal castles that he now had access to with his elevated status as the um, successor to the throne. Um, he was not seen as French. He was not seen as any, uh, much to do with France at all. Sure, he did still have the title of um, you know, have owning the Kingdom of Normandy, but at this point, obviously, everything was much more separated than it is in nowadays France. Um, so, yeah, he really didn't have too much of a choice right from the get-go um, because of, uh, say, his uh, political status and his political kind of rapport. Um, clout, I guess you could say, as opposed to Richard, it just was not comparable. Um, and also as well, see things got more difficult um, considering that when Richard died, they were fairly like, on the fence of whether they were going to be, the, barons, the French barons were going to join officially the French side or help the English crown. When Richard died, they kind of said, OK, well, we're not going to align with John, so the only other option is the French crown. So they aligned with the French. So the French forces got stronger, and obviously the English forces got weaker uh, due to this as well. Um, it also didn't help, again, with the Pope uh, doing various smear campaigns on uh, King John, thanks to French barons who were more than happy to spread the bad news and, you know, give him bad names and, as uh, you know, different um, titles and nicknames, so to speak. But obviously that's his relationship with the Pope, uh, so that's a slightly different subject, which I'm sure we'll get on to. Okay, cool. And uh, so, Mark, um, I'm going to come to you for this. Um, so the relationship between uh, the church and, and the barons starts be to become bad. Um, firstly, um, tell us about the uh, why King John and the church's relationship becomes so poisonous and so bad. It becomes so bad because at this point we do, there's a change in the Archbishop of Canterbury dies. Um, and it's beholden upon the king to appoint a new Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, bearing in mind that at this point, an Archbishop of Canterbury is probably more, it's less, I wouldn't say it's less religiously important as it is today, but it has a lot more secular power than the current Archbishop has. Um, so, so also today's Archbishop is purely the head of the Church of England. Um, obviously, back then it was pre-Reformation, so he was still beholden to the Pope, um, but he was Pope, the Pope's representative in England. Um, and 
we, but also the Archbishop of Canterbury is not quite an early prime minister, but in that kind of ilk, shall we say. And obviously his father had a very tumultuous relationship with one of his archbishops of Canterbury, who um, the cathedral at Canterbury is be the, the current one is built pretty much in his honour um, in Beckett. So you you do have this role as a senior civil servant as well as being the Pope's representative in England. So it becomes the appointment of an archbishop, an archbishop of Canterbury at this time is very, very important. And of course, it becomes a bit of a two-way power struggle because John wants his man to be archbishop and the Pope would prefer a different candidate. And so they have a major falling out. John appoints his man anyway. And as a result, the country of England, or John and then England as a result, is excommunicated by the Pope. And this is a major issue in the medieval world. That, that every single village revolves around its church. Um, we think about times in history about the village revolving around the tavern. At this point, it's the church, then it's the tavern. And so for it to be shut and locked up and you cannot go, like the whole country is cut off from the church, is a major thing. That, that it, it must have been to them what 2020 was to us in terms of everything, everything you know has stopped. So it is a it is a major, major problem for John. And so when he then starts to reconcile with the Pope, he actually then he he has he makes John swear an allegiance to him. So it then becomes that John and England as a result becomes a vassal state of the papacy. And this is going to lead to all kinds of problems going forward for for John because whatever he wants to do, he has to ask the Pope's permission. Mm -hmm. Alex, do you want to add anything about the Church and, and King John's relationship? Yeah, so um, uh, as a little hobby of mine, I do actually look into uh, religious studies throughout history. Um, and again, it's one of those things where the more you read, the more re you realise, actually, medieval people weren't that religious. Um, they were in namesake, but they weren't in reality. Um, for example, as again, Mark, Mark said, about uh, being excommunicated and uh, the churches were ordered to be closed down. Um, they weren't actually closed down. England pretty much just ignored the Pope, as they did mul multiple times throughout history. Um, so they would show, they would maybe, um, you know, they would lock down and close some of the major cathedrals during the bishops, uh, various bishops uh, around Europe uh, visits. Um, but again, local churches were pretty much gathering points. They were pretty much like your Sunday market. Uh, people relied on them and they said, even if, you know, <laughs> we're not going to close down their uh, um, their best way of communication and sharing news on a Sunday because that'll put them into the well, dark ages um, to use a, you know, just to lack of a better word. Um, so, and again, for example, you can see this because I'm from Norwich. Now, uh, Norwich can hold its head up high and say that it's the only city uh, in the world to be officially excommunicated. Usually it's one or two people, a little bit of an area, a, a church maybe, um, an entire city being excommunicated is not something that should be taken lightly. Um, Norwich just ignored this excommunication as a city. It continued to prosper. It continued to trade uh, and sell their wares. Uh, all the churches were open. All the Sunday markets and re uh, various religious festivals continued to be open. Um, and then the Pope uh, disregarded the, or like kind of undid the excommunication because he uh, began to, and I forget which Pope it was at the time, it was during the 14th century. Um, but um, 
he, they basically said uh, what they were evidently thinking. Um, okay, well, I don't want to be taking a fool here and say something and have some uh, a group of people in a faraway country just blatantly ignore me. So he undid the excommunication for that reason, um, or possibly for that reason, because I thought, you know, I don't want to be saying, I don't want to be taking a fool here. I don't want to be saying something and not being taken into consideration. Um, it was the same kind of thing as, as you mentioned, with this uh, Stephen Langton, who was um, pushed forward as uh, by the Pope to be the next Archbishop, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, that's not for religious reasons. It doesn't mean that this Mr. Lang uh, Langton, I can't pronounce his name now, Langton, um, was you know the most pious or the most religious or did the most prayers in a day. Um, he was a powerful person. He was an influential person. And there was obviously, you know, back-end deals and handshakes being made between him and the, uh, the Pope to say, you know, I'll get you this seat if you, you know, I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back. So that was evidently what was happening in the background. And uh, for whatever reason, um, King John uh, didn't agree um, with this decision to make him the new uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. And because of that, the Pope got very angry for the same reason, um, really, as the um, with the excommunication of Norwich and how that unfortunately failed for the Pope. Um, because it's seen that a king, any king, was basically, uh, he was sent down from God and he was chosen by God to rule. Now, if the king is saying something which actively goes against what the Pope is saying, who is right? Well, the Pope's not going to be wrong, is he? So he has the power to excommunicate certain kings. That's why the power of excommunication is there, to basically silence people or make them seem, kind of scare them, um, that, uh, you know, uh, into doing the right thing. Because the idea is, oh, I don't want to be excommunicated. I don't want to be condemned to hell. Um, however, this usually, unfortunately, doesn't really make much difference. Um, again, for example, um, when the Scottish decided to wage war and uh, invade England against Henry VIII, the Pope warned against this, said, don't do it. You will be excommunicated if you do it. They did it anyway. Um, the king, with a force of over 20,000 men, marched south uh, from over the Scottish border and started to invade England um, against Henry VIII. Every single one of those soldiers knew they'd be excommunicated and sentenced to hell if they marched over the border with their king. But they did it anyway. They just didn't care. Which goes to show that, obviously, they were getting paid a livelihood for doing this. Maybe they didn't have a choice, but then w wouldn't you rather run away from an evil king who's condemned to hell and cast down by God rather than you know lose your place in eternal bliss in heaven? You'd just run away, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd, you wouldn't be a soldier fighting in your mortal life for a king that's actively against God. Um, so it just goes to show that, you know, condemnation with the Pope, it, they had to be harsh and throw around excommunication uh, to be taken seriously because the people who were writing down the stories as news and could spread the word were religious people, you know, the Illuminations who... Um, uh, text was usually written and spread and word was given around by different monks, abbots, canons, priests, uh, vicars, etc. of the church. They were like BBC News back in the day. You know, if you wanted to get a certain narrative across, you'd use the church to do it. And mm. that's the only reason why kings really, as influential people, were worried about this, because they knew that they were going to get, you know, a storm of bad media come towards them. And it, again, I think this is something that you, this is why you don't hear about while all this was going on, King John was fighting off the Scottish from the north. Um, he uh, quashed a rebellion in Ireland. Um, he uh, fought back uh, the Welsh rebel prince, uh, Llewellyn. Uh, I think his name was Llewellyn of uh, Gwynedd. And, um, then, yeah, and I say the, the Irish rebel, uh, rebellion in uh, 1210. So okay. you don't hear much about all those massive feats of, you know, he, was a, he wasn't a military mastermind himself, but he knew the people to a point to get the work done for him. And you don't hear much about it. And guess who was writing the history books at the time and keeping the texts? The Pope and his mm -hmm. many, you know, his many handymen. Uh, yeah. And I think that definitely has a part to play. Definitely. 
Yeah, uh, thanks for adding that. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to talk about the uh, the uh, Barons now, um, Mark. Just explain who the Barons are firstly, and then talk a little bit about how the relationship breaks down between the King and the Barons. So the Barons are, they rule areas of the country on behalf of the King and on behalf of themselves, obviously. Um, they are given the land in servitude, um, in, with promise of servitude in military arms, things like that, should the need arise. So it, it, I don't like using this term the feudal system because it's not quite as simple as how they just, how they teach it in year seven at school where it's the triangle with the king at the top, the barons in the middle and the peasants underneath. It's not quite as simple as that. But it that is sort of the concept of, of the barons. So they are they are the powerful people. So we've already come across one in William Marshall. He's sort of the most important in the in in the Plantagenet era of being the strongest baron that can hold a kingdom together for the kings, uh, but there's numerous ones of them, and there's fa factions of them. So some of them are it, it's family factions because certain barons marry the children of other barons and things like that to try and consolidate either one inherit land to become even more powerful or just to consolidate it so there's sort of i wouldn't go as far as to say it's early political parties but you've already starting to get this kind of idea of different blocks starting to form we've seen before as we talked to when we talk, spoke about prince arthur that some of the barons declared for arthur over john some declared for john over arthur so there's these factions starting to develop and these become more and more powerful as we go along. So when, for example, when when John's father, Henry II, comes into England following the, the reign of Stephen and the peace treaty that was signed between Empress Matilda and Stephen to bring about the end of the anarchy, when Henry arrives, he goes to all the barons who were part of, who supported Stephen, stripped them and confiscated of their, of their castles and land but then gave it back to them. and the reason why he did that was that he knew that these men were strong and powerful if he confiscated their lands he'd have that they're grouped together and they're causing problems what he's doing is he's going okay i'll take your lands i'll give them back to you but you're only getting them back because i want to give them back to you and so that was the makeup of the Plantagenet baronhood underneath underneath the king, and so so um, <coughs> as this um, as this starts to play out in terms of by the time we get to King John's reign, we've already seen he's attempted to usurp Richard whilst he was on crusade, where we would have had certain barons on his side. Then then he's had the issue with the inheritance of the throne in respect to Arthur and he's had Baron supporting him, he's had Baron supporting Arthur. So already there's this fractious line from early on in his reign and even before that of Barons that are against John. So they're not all on his side straight. They're not all on his side. And gradually as the events that start unfolding, more and more barons that were in support of John, they've got somewhere to go. They've got so, uh, and there's this other side that you can go to. It's not like a king with just trying to think of one. Say, for example, William the First, the Conqueror, when he comes over, once once the conquest is complete, all of those, what he does is gives a lot of land to the knights that are actually quite low level barons in the north in normandy yes the likes of odo um, and robert of martin get large tracts of land but some of the others they come out of nowhere 
And the reason why he does that is because he doesn't want to make any of the, bat, the, the real big Norman Baron that much more powerful, but he can control it if he creates new English Barons. And so he's able then, he's got almost universal support within this Norman Baronhood. Whereas with John, there's already this split of Barons that are against him and the Barons that are for him. And gradually, as, as events unfold, the split starts to move across and as as more barons become disillusioned with his kingship, they start stepping across to the other side of this line, which is will eventually result in the major aspects of what is remembered of John's reign. So, Mark, tell us about this uh, meeting, um, uh, the meeting of the council between King John to hear their grievances. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll actually step back a little bit further um, in that by this point there is an open civil war in the baronhood um, of the barons that are supporting John and against John so it's actually broken out London itself is captured by the rebel barons and so you've got this London we kind of forget just how powerful medieval London was not so much in terms of political power or economic power but of military power you know the wall the walled city was intact you know you have the two massive castles you've got the tower in the east and you've got by barnard's castle in the in the and the west of the city um around blackfriars bridge that area that's where it was so you've got these two on 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 the edge of the city, you've got these two massive castles. The rest of it is is, is heavily fortified. Um, so once the barons, of rebel barons, take control of that, John doesn't have much where to go. So he, he decamps then to to Windsor, one of the three massive castles on the Thames, with the Tower, Windsor, and Wallingford being the other, the third. And there he negotiates this meeting of the barons, the council of the barons, and they come together to, in effect, sign a peace treaty. Okay, so, and for a number of things, it's to go back to the Charter of Liberties of Henry the First. It's to rectify, uh, ratify the ancient rights of the City of London. There's not many major new things within this. You know, it, it's just saying, but we recognise this document, we recognise this document, we recognise this document. The biggest one of the treaties uh, or, or biggest aspect is that it's announced that 25, there will be a 25 member Baron Council that can look at whether or not these the things that are listed within this peace treaty are being met. And that's sort of the overriding concept of it. Um, because the rest of it is all just sort of ratifications and the king admit, John admitting that he, he will recognise prior charters going. And this is then signed and, signed and stamped by the king at Runnymede. Um, which is where it's known that uh, this is uh, the birthplace of English democracy and things like that. But actually, the Magna Carta, as it will become known, it was never set out to be this founding document of English democracy. It, was never, it wasn't our constitution like the American constitution would become. It, 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 it's actually a very simple document. It, it's a peace treaty. It's a simple peace treaty to end a, a to end an uprising, but as we will further go on and see, and then later on, the next two centuries, it it's a it, it becomes the bedrock of the constitution, and everything else from there is set in stone from that point on. Each, each next document we have that builds up to the English constitution comes from that one document. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, again, the barons get support from uh, the Pope, don't they? Uh, uh, just before the Magna Carta. So just tell us a little bit about why the Pope decides to back the barons over the king. Does that go to the, the uh, you know, the history between the Pope and the king? Yeah, no, I'm not 100% sure on this. Um, but again, the Pope, in, in terms of the reconciliation, that happened between John and the Pope, one of the main things was to become John pledged homage to the Pope and became his vessel. So I think it's just one of those things that the Pope sides with the Barons because he and urges John to reconcile with the Barons and for, for his own personal interest. I don't think that there's any sort of major sort of idea of how we, we should make all of more of a democracy in Europe or anything like that. I think it's purely self-interest. He knows that the tide is turning against John and as he does something, John will be ousted and someone else will become king. So I think the Pope's intervention is purely for, for, for the Pope's, yeah. Pope's self-interest because he's sort of pledged homage, he's vassal in England, he's got power over him if the status quo is changed because the barons imprison Richard Killian, which is probably the most likely outcome. Richard, John. Um, Killian, which would be the most likely outcome, then we know that the Pope will lose that power. So my guess would be that the only reason the Pope gets involved is for, for pure self-interest in this. Yeah. And the way, the reason why I would say that is that Almost immediately that it's signed, the Pope is the person who who knows it. Yeah. So, as soon as John signs it and ends ends the issue temporarily by signing it, the Pope then knows it, saying no, that this isn't right. So that would again suggest that this is a power. This is all power politics by the Pope. So he gets him to sign it. And sign the peace treaty, end the war with the barons, only to then annul it because he just wants John's servitude. And if he's handed over a big chunk of it to the barons, which it probably wasn't that big a deal at the time as what it's made out to be now, um, I do believe that this all just looks of power politics taking place. Yeah. So can you go into a little bit more detail about the the signing of this document and, and again, its importance? Yeah, so the king comes from his power base at Windsor. The, the, the rebel barons are in London, so Runnymede is on the Thames. It, it's kind of equidistant from the two. Now, bearing in mind that Windsor is now just the other side of Heathrow Airport, it's sort of almost a suburb of London in, in modern day thinking. It's about 20 miles from the city. So it's quite a fair a fair distance. So Runnymede was chosen as the neutral location um, that the signing would take place. So obviously we've had the council, we've had the peace negotiations. And I said, when you look at some of the things, some of the articles in it, a lot of it is just reconfirming articles that were already in place. Henry the Fir uh, Henry the First's Charter of Liberties, uh, the Liberties of London, uh, which were laid down by Edward the Confessor. There's a few other old, old ones, but the big one, like I say, is this election of the Council of Twenty Five Barons by the Barons themselves as well. So it's not the king picking 25, the barons are uh, electing 25 members to sit on a council. Um, one to advise the king, but also to hold him to a, also to hold it to account. And that is what most people in history deem to be the first parliament. You know, there are things similar earlier on. So if we go back to 1086 with the Council of Salisbury, which is where the 
where the Doomsday Book is ordered, and that the, the the Barons come in and swear homage to William the Conqueror. There is that kind of element, but it's slightly different because they are coming at the king's bequest. These are being elected to by their own by their own class, the Barons would to advise and hold to account the king. So this is why it sort of got this element now that we see it as the birth of English democracy or British democracy going forward, because this is a point, this is the first time where uh, the people of that, of the people of a class are electing their peers to represent them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why it's held in such importance. But it's in terms of a lot of the one, a lot of the charters, a lot of the the things in democracy movement, the hard to stand out all the time. Like right? so if you remember back to 2020 and people were saying like the lockdown is illegal because Magna Carta says that we've got these liberties. And it it's kind of like it underpins the whole legal, judicial, parliamentary foundations of this country mm-hmm. is now seen in this document. So that's how important it actually becomes. Yeah. Anyway, so um, as Mark says, the king actually seals Magna Carta. But then, of course, obviously, he's going to, uh, you know, break his promise on this uh, document. Um, and then King John goes on an eight-week campaign which will lead him to a siege at Rochester Castle. Alex, I'll bring you in to talk, talk about this, please, mate, if you want more. So for this one, again, we actually have to go back a little bit. So um, we've got to understand why the barons, after the unfortunate failure of the Magna Carta, despite all intentions, um, why the barons suddenly felt so uh, confident in themselves as to why they could basically commit treachery against the king and rise up in rebellion against the king. I mean, Britain may be a small island compared to some, but it's still a very large area, so very um, politically diverse and intense area. Um, How did these barons all get together and suddenly have the confidence to go against the king? Um, now, one thing they actually did, um, Louis actually arrived in England with a uh, little resistance. So King Louis was now uh, involved um, uh, with the uh, with the rebellion. Not officially, but he had made uh, times over there to speak with the barons, kind of in private against the king's will. Uh, the king apparently knew that these meetings were coming in place, and also letters were being sent across. Um, but uh, there wasn't, unfortunately, because England was so fragmented during this time, there wasn't too much power he had to stop these meetings from taking place. So to anger King John even more, while John's armies were battling the barons in England uh, through various sieges and uh, some battles as well, um, the barons actually sent a letter to uh, Louis VIII, son of the um, the king of uh, King Philip of France, and uh, he was obviously heir to the throne. Now the letter invited Louis to invade England to make John's situation even worse because they needed some assistance, and as we mentioned before. Uh, there were quite a few barons uh, living in France, both English and French barons, who had ties with Richard, but not with John. So, who are they most likely to now fall under the reign of? Well, it would be the French king, not the English king. So, um, this is where, obviously, again, London got involved. You said how important London were uh, was at the start, uh, what, earlier. Um, so, as I say, king, uh, uh, Prince Louis uh, arrived in England with little resistance, Um, He entered London and the rebel barons and citizens of London applauded his arrival and proclaimed him as the new king of England straight off the bat. Now, obviously, that was a very bold move um, because it's seen as not only the barons were in favour of this, but also the citizens were in favour of this as well. So it doesn't really paint King John in a very um, structurally stable and uh, concrete light. Um, So, obviously, this was obviously despite uh, the crown still being quite firmly on King John's head. Um, Louis then 
began leading his army towards King John, forcing John's men to surrender in multiple castles, uh, such as uh, Guildford, Farnham, and Winchester. And uh, by July 12, 16, about a third of England was actually already under Louis's control with the help from the various bar barons. With that num uh, uh, number, though, it's always a bit difficult, so I say a third of England. Now, because the barons had to say they were under the reign of King John while Louis wasn't involved, but as soon as Louis was involved, they could kind of just switch their colours. So, really, King uh, Prince Louis uh, claimed that a third of England was under his reign, when actually he'd never even stepped foot militarily in any of these, or most of these places. They had just flipped colours, and they had just flipped sides, and they were now uh, swearing allegiance with him. Now, with the Siege of Rochester, now I will admit, I haven't actually done too much research, particularly, this is part kind of just off the top of my head. If you want to talk about the Siege of Dover, I'm more than happy to speak about that. Yeah, tell, um, us, about, tell us about Gosso. Yeah, tell oh, us about Dover. Well, 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 yeah. um, so this is one of many uh, notable sieges. Um, there was actually another siege at uh, Headingham, or Headingham uh, in modern-day Essex, and this is actually against one of the most influential barons who was present at the Magna Carta signing. Now, um, this, i uh, just trying to remember his name, uh, Robert de Vere. Robert de Vere, he was the Earl of Oxford, and his primary house was at Headingham. Uh, Headingham Castle, which is currently one of the best preserved and almost untouched uh, Norman castles. It is very similar. Obviously, you see the picture there of Rochester Castle. Um, it is very similar to that. It's just a bit smaller, but it's still just... Well, it, it's an incredible setting, basically. You're in the middle of the woods, a private estate, and you've just got this giant castle that stands. Now, at Headingham Castle, um, King John laid siege to uh, the castle. Technically, at this point, it was French-held, um, with, again, the help of the barons. Um, no, sorry, actually, no, he was currently besieging Colchester Castle, which was French-held, and he had to turn his attention to Headingham because he basically he, he thought he had an opportunity to capture one of the more, most influential re uh, rebel barons uh, in England at this time, who was Robert de Vere. Now, when that happened, it's during a siege where there's a legend that goes about the defenders of the castle throwing fish at the attackers um, from the battlements to show that they had plenty of food. They didn't care how long uh, King John was going to besiege them for. King John's wasting his time. They can hold out. Um, that's actually because the, the castle Henningham uh, had a secret tunnel to a nearby fish pond, which survives to this day. It's now a koi pond. It's not a, like a tench or carp pond as it would have uh, been previously. But um, so this is like a little legend of, and some people say when it's like, uh, again, there's multiple ways of this, but there's one uh, little kind of uh, British myth that goes around about like the day it rained fish. And this is one of the, original possible uh, origins of the story, basically. Um, despite this very cocky defensive strategy and uh, attack on the uh, attacker's morale, um, they were actually uh, taken over, so King John did succeed, which again just goes to show that, you know, he had very capable men. If he wasn't doing a siege specifically himself, he knew the people, and he still had very powerful people and military masterminds to conduct these type of sieges on. I mean, at the time, uh, Headingham was a very, very large castle and uh, uh, ridiculously defensive, just like Rochester. Um, so then, as I say, so uh, Headingham uh, was now taken over successfully. I'm not too sure um, whether he was captured, per se, Robert de Vere. However, we do know that the Earl's Lands was declared forfeit and he was uh, declared as uh, surrendered to the king. So regardless of physically what happened to this Earl, he was basically, his part of the rebellion was quenched. Uh, he was stopped. Now... Well, for a year, because in 1217, Heading Castle was again besieged. However, this time, um, uh, well, he, he, the Earl had kind of been given his lands back, or at least was still under the protection of 
uh, King John and if this was now actually uh, Prince Louis who was attacking the castle. So it's now the French who are attacking the castle, which goes to show that if the Earl was given his lands back by the King, as you mentioned before, you know, taking the lands away and then given back because he can, evidently that might have been the same situation here. Um, it just goes to show that the, the, uh, this certain rebel baron was now signing allegiance, uh, allegiance with the King. Uh, which kind of just goes to show again how fickle their alliance at the time with the French was. Um, regardless, though, um, at the Siege of Rochester, it was uh, a very long siege and quite a desperate siege as well. So they couldn't breach the keep. They breached the bailey, um, the outer bailey with the walls, and they, the King John's army was pretty much saddled up in the outer bailey of the castle, besieging, making sure that there was no uh, boats that could come in from the sally port uh, and enter the keep. Uh, and it was just a classic bog standard uh, siege just to kind of starve the enemy out until they surrendered. Apparently, things got very um, uh, very difficult inside the keep. They had to eat their own horses, and then they had to eat their own cats and dogs, and the rats, and the mice, and the bats, and all that lovely stuff. Now, the siege um, was completed at one thing which, unfortunately, again, is kind of it skewed and made quite, how do you say, um, I guess you could say, quite made quite extreme by some historians or some history books or even maybe TV documentaries, etc., where they basically say that Rochester Castle fell due to uh, pigs on fire. Um, no pigs were ever set on fire at Rochester Castle. Uh, what they did was, again, just like um, King Richard had done at that uh, French uh, castle, when unfortunately he was shot by a crossbow bolt, um, he was inspecting the sappers. Now, sappers, uh, still to this day used in the British Army um, under the Royal Engineers, these sappers, originally, their role was to mine uh, a hole underneath a, uh, a castle wall or tower with the attention of, uh, so they hold, held it up with wooden stakes, wooden beams to make a structure underneath, just like any mine shaft that you'd see. What they would then do is they would put loads of embers and tinder and kindling and just uh, basically make a fire. And then what they would also do is to ensure that the uh, the fire would raise and then it would get loads of smoke, it would get very hot, and this would cause the ground to cave in and sending whatever strong, uh, stone structure on top to also cave in, what they would do is they would get pig's fat. So they slaughtered pigs uh, in Rochester town, they harvested the pig fat in bowls or barrels, and then basically with a paintbrush they just slathered it over the supporting beams that are holding up the uh, the mine shaft, um, so that is how we say you know, and, and obviously then they set it alight. They got out of there as quickly as possible and just waited for the smoke to build up and the ground to cave in, which sent down one of the towers. Um, so this is where you get that legend uh, occurring of the famous pigs on fire. Um, yeah. I've, I've heard an American documentary it said they sent pigs on fire like incendiary pigs kind of a homage to Roman warfare tactics, which again is questionable in itself. Um, and then they kind of like uh, herded them into uh, mm -hmm. an underground mine shaft and then sealed it up. When they died, they exploded because the pig <laughs> explodes apparently. And then that went down a thing. That's why I don't watch American documentary. Well, most yeah. of them. And, and, and going back to that, I think the, the, the movie Ironclad actually... Uh... Um, I have watched. There was a scene like that where they herded pigs into the tunnel, and and of course, pig screams are awful, you know. So, uh, yeah. again, you know, Hollywood, eh? Hollywood. Yeah, yeah it, make, it, it makes sense. It makes sense to do it a bit in a film, like to say yeah. it on a documentary is a bit like come yeah. on, like. But yeah. in a film, how boring would it be to see someone just walking that into a tunnel with a barrel and just? Yeah, of course. Fashion some pig yeah. fat around. Well, I'm glad you, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Alex, because, you know, that's obviously the, what I'd heard as well, you know, um, about that um, many times, about that fact that they herded pigs into a tunnel, you know. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those unfortunate things. Well, I mean, it depends on what you want to gain from history. Some people want to gain, like, oh, this amazing thing happened that I had no idea about. Or even then, you know, this amazing thing happened so long ago on my doorstep kind of thing. You know, I mean, I, I'm always amazed at my local history from Norfolk. Every single time I read about it, I just realise that Norfolk was so much more rich, powerful and influential than I ever thought it possibly could be. I mean, mm-hmm. Norwich was more important than London. London is only the capital of uh, capital city of England now because Norwich was offered being a capital city and they turned it down said they don't want that that kind of people associated with capital cities to come to their city um, you know they were happy being their own kind of like walled city out in uh, out in the Norfolk Broads area and you know far away mm-hmm. um, but again it depends what you want from history do you want to be amazed and you know put in awe at the facts you uh, hear or do you want to find the truth of these facts and little urban myths that you hear? And, you know, what's more important to you, um, being amazed or knowing the truth? The truth may not be as dramatic and amazing. You know, it's like trebuchets. People love trebuchets. Um, what is it? Uh, the, the Jerusalem, Kingdom of Kingdom of Heaven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, with Orlando Bloom. Um, yeah, Kingdom of Heaven. You see all these giant trebuchets firing in the dark and you see all these giant fireballs um it didn't happen as soon as you put a fire a set a you know put pitch on a stone set it on fire as soon as that uh the stone gets chucked in the air it's extinguished it doesn't do anything <laughs> um the the it was meant to be like the residual heat possibly could set some thatch on fire but then it's or knock over a lantern or something like that and then already have something that was very flammable attached to it which hopefully would then set set it on fire um and even then you know you have these trebuchets firing like half a mile to get to the walls i mean 300 foot 400 foot maybe um it was known fairly Obviously, I mean, Todd Cutler has done this as well, that a longbowman could fire further or at least the same distance than the strongest trebuchet could. Woolwolf, um, during the reign of Edward I against Stirling, that was put almost right against the castle walls of Stirling. Sure, Stirling was on, um, you know, on a rocky crag, um, so it had to be put closer to get the kind of, you know, the traje- trajectory. Um, but, you know, it wasn't you know, in the village half a mile away, it was right next to the walls of the outer bailey and the wooden palisades that were defending a castle. Um, so it's important to know that, okay, you might hear an amazing fact, fact check it first before you start spreading it and definitely before you start making movies about it because if it's not true, mm-hmm. then, you know, you just, people are going to want to believe pigs being thrown into yeah. a pit yeah. on fire more than a guy with a paintbrush varnishing some wood yeah. and being lard. Yeah, what's more dramatic? But yeah, yeah you, I'd, I'd rather know the truth than whatever is more dramatic, to be, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. Because yeah. I think that's more interesting to me. Sorry, I yeah. get flabbergasted more by the truth than some random thing someone just made yeah. up which were based on truth. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so going back to the sieges, um, so Dover, so the first siege of Dover. Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. So the famous two sieges of uh, Dover. So um, while proud of his son, the King of France, King Philip, I believe I mentioned, yeah, it was King Philip, wasn't it? Uh, this, this is a thing I struggle with. There's so many names in history and so many dates, I always forget them. Yeah, um, Philip, Philip II. Yes, indeed, yeah, and obviously a Prince Louis, yeah. So King King Philip, Prince Louis. Um, so yes, yeah, so I was like, while proud of his son, the King of France, King Philip, told Louis that he had made a mistake. Um, so he was sitting there in France, like, overlooking because basically uh, Prince Louis had to prove himself, prove that he was worthy of the throne. Um, so this is why he decided to embark on this military campaign when there other were other military advisors and well-seasoned military commanders who were more than happy to take it up. Um, it was kind of like Agincourt, but where the, the prince did turn up and where the person, there was just one person to, um, you know, set the rules rather than Agincourt, where there's loads of people who said they wanted to do it, 
but no one was actually put forward as the one person to actually embark on these rules and, you know, uh, make it into a battle plan. Um, so, sorry, I don't know if you can hear that, by the way. I've got a really squeaky chair at the moment. I should have sorted that out before I, uh, <laughs> before right. I get one. need a bit of WD-40 on that, I reckon. Um, so, anyway... So Dover Castle was, at the time, one of the biggest castles in Britain. Um, it was called the Key of England. Um, so basically, if you held Dover, you held the Key of, uh, of England because it was home to one of the largest and most influential and bustling trading ports and military hubs as well. Later, you had Portsmouth and Winchelsea. Um, but before that, Dover was one of the biggest military hubs um, to basically ferry soldiers over to France. Um, so it was obviously definitely needed. Now, with the um, with Dover Castle, it was currently being held by soldiers loyal to John uh, under the leadership of Hubert de Burr. So Dover Castle was obviously heavily defended and heavily garrisoned at this time. King John wasn't a fool. He made sure to put as, enough money into it as he possibly could. And it was actually shortly before the Barons' Wars that King John spent a ridiculous amount of money um, in bolstering up the battlements and defensibility of the south coast of England during this time. Famously, Corfe uh, Castle, which um, became kind of like his treasure trove, his coffer, um, that was extremely defended with the best architects working at it at a time. Um, at, at the time, sorry. So, as I say, lots of castles were only recently defended because King John knew this was coming. He knew there was going to be tensions and he wanted to make sure he could uh, defend against it. And how did he do that? He raised the taxes further, which is what everyone remembers him for and are very angry for him for, saying, oh, it's just capital capitalism gone mad. If he didn't raise the taxes, he couldn't afford these uh, extra defence abilities uh, in his south, uh, south Coast castles, and we'd all be speaking French right now. That is just for long and short, but that is the truth. Um, so anyway, Prince Louis uh, began his siege uh, of Dover on the 19th of July, 1216. Um, now, despite siege engines constantly hurling rocks and... Um, uh, multiple tunnels being dug under the castle walls in an attempt to bring them down, just like, obviously, they'd seen him, uh, King John's own men, his own sappers, do at Rochester. Um, Dover was still standing strong against Louis's forces. In, in fact, as well, so Louis had spent the best part of three months and the majority of his army on this siege without prevailing, forcing Louis to uh, call a truce on the 14th of October and return to London, which was still French-owned because he was still seen as the, uh, um, as the true king of England during this time. Um, so, yeah, the, the first siege, unfortunately, it was... It, pretty much just stagnant. There was damages caused, of course. There were little flurries, melees, and skirmishes at this time. Um, but it was just so big, it was just, it wasn't big enough. Uh, it, it just, it was too big to completely envelop by Louis's men. Um, so they still managed to get supplies in, despite uh, Louis's men's best efforts. And because he spent three months there, all while being fairly stagnant, not much was happening uh, around the other times. I mean, again, you had smaller sieges, the rebellious uh, barons were helping out as well. Um, but they needed King, you know, they needed Prince Louis to, you know, be seen in other places. They need him to take a seat in different political talks. He couldn't do this while he was staying stagnant, uh, looking at... Um, uh, Dover Castle and not taking it over. So he decided kind of just to pack it in and uh, kind of disband the siege. And um, as I say, yeah, so he returned. Um, he returned to London during this time. And during this time as well, King John was also busy besieging the Baron held castles at Rochester and Windsor. He had lost Windsor uh, during this time as well. So he was busy getting that back. Um, so that's pretty much how the first siege of Rochester went. Obviously, the second mm -hmm. siege of Rochester, uh, sorry, that was how the first siege of Dover went. Yeah, the, the, the second siege was a little bit later on, wasn't it? Which we'll get onto uh, in a second. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it didn't include a notable member. Yeah, as well. That's all right. And uh, of course, um, so I mean, in King John's uh, period of war against the barons, he does eventually end up 
in the northern part of the country. Um, he does actually have another successful campaign because the southeast campaign is actually quite successful as well. Um, he sends part of his army out to your area, East Anglia, uh, Alex. Um, and then, of course, he is going to be coming back and he is going to go f uh, for a place called The Wash where something's going to happen, isn't it? So would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Um, so I, it's really bad of me, I know, but I don't <clears throat> actually know too much about it. Um, it was kind of down, yeah, it's always been downplayed. I haven't really heard too much about it. I've been to Kings Lynn where he was visiting at the time when the baggage train did kind of get <laughs> washed away. Um, I can give you the basics, but I don't know if uh, Mark can give a bit more information. Yeah, on Mark, this. what would you think? Yeah, so he's already on campaign at this point, and he's actually called, contracted the dysentery that he's going to die from. Um, a short while later um, by this point. But, yeah, he's, again, a lot of this is wrapped up in myth and legend. So how, how exactly did it play out? My gut feeling is that hopefully Alex can, might be able to shed a bit more light on this, but I think the wash is quite tidal. Uh, um, yes, it's all tidal. Yeah. So, so it's basically a mud flat. Um so it's not a beach. Um, the Wash is an area which used to be Fenland. Um, so actually, we talk about a lot of coastal erosion and global warming, etc., which obviously is very true and it's very, very apparent. Um, Britain actually used to look a lot differently. We've actually reclaimed a lot of land in the northern part of East Anglia around like Cambridgeshire Way. You've got the Cambridgeshire Fens near Peterborough connecting to uh, Lincoln and Skegness. Um, and then in the area around um, uh, Kings Lynn, Hunstanton, Heacham area on the north, it's kind of the north north western um, area of Norfolk. It used to be kind of Fenland, where it's like classic kind of broads looking, where you've got a lot, it's waterlogged pretty much, and you've got all these causeways and um, reeds and mangrove areas. Uh, but a lot of it nowadays is just mud basically with all those are just decomposers turned into just mud and it's just it's like quicksand really it's a, it's very stodgy mud it's very easy to get bogged down in it's not considered safe by any means it is just it's dangerous and it was at the point of in the medieval times around the 12th century and 13th century it was then turning from fenland to just bogland pretty much just mm -hmm. a muddy mess and so yeah, it's very so it's even possible that when you say about this part that happens in the wash, which it could have been, fen it's probably more Finland than sort of how we would imagine, you say, he, lost it, he loses it in the wash. We're thinking that big bay. Yeah, area, I, I so. think there was definitely a lot more uh, Finland with raised areas. So during the uh, the Bronze Age period, they had actually built a lot of earth embankments uh, as causeways, where the area was basically waterlogged. Think of everything underwater, and then you would have certain fields which were just above um, the water level. And the Bronze Age people were taken, like either cattle, oxen, or um, most, most importantly, sheep. Uh, from one paddock to another, they built these raised earth causeways, or some even made of, uh, they're basically wooden bridges, which went on for hundreds of yards and sometimes even had houses on top of them. Um, what you're seeing there is what the medieval people were using were the remnants of these causeways and these earth banks that were built to take farm animals and livestock from one area in the Fenland to another. Um, so yeah, I assume at least that's what they were using during this time. Yeah, uh, they obviously just the, 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 they're they're cutting across it, probably heading up towards Lincoln, being sort of a major medieval position, which I think we're going to come on to a, a, right at the end, um, and get the tide floods in, it washes the baggage train away, which also includes the crown jewels. Yeah, so there's that myth, isn't there, with the crown jewels? You know, so. Again, you know, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt, some of these things. Um, but again, is that is that something that um, actually happened with the crown jewels? I, I think it's something that it, it did happen. 
to some extent. Um, it's very easy for, you know, horses to get bogged down in muddy areas, then to, you know, go into a bit of fright, start trotting around, um, you know, a, a rope snaps and a treasure trove full of stuff or a bit of a part of a baggage train falls into, you know, mm-hmm. falls down into the water. And then the people who might be, you know, heavily armoured at this time, because obviously it is not a safe area, it's, it is a military campaign still, um, they're not going to get bogged down in there to retrieve it. They don't have a, it's not possible for them to do that. You know, they'd die if they tried. Mm-hmm. Um and but more again, pa- as I alluded to before, I think it's also a bit of a smear campaign that, oh, despite everything King John has done, is this really what he gets, you know, remembered for? Taxes, yeah. Yeah. raising taxes, mm-hmm. being useless, having bad nicknames. Oh, and also he lost his jewels and his crown or whatever uh, yeah. in, in a muddy pool. Yeah, I, fair enough. And, and again, as Mark's uh, alluded to, sorry. Um, and more power, sorry. And more powers itinerant at this point as well, so... Yeah. There is, although London is the capital, um, the capital really is wherever the king is in residence at that time. So yeah. mm-hmm. things like the crown jewels, wherever the king is, the crown jewels would be would be with him. So they would have been there, whether they were lost, whether it was partial, probably like partially lost. I think if it, if like the 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 main the crown the sword the scepter parts went we'd know more about it it wouldn't be that that mythical aspect so maybe it's a few jewels that mm-hmm. was part of it that went but in terms of sort of the the art of the piece of kingship um that's what um uh, that's what i would actually think that the more important parts would didn't get lost but yeah like Alex said it's part of that smear campaign he's lost the jewels so yeah do you want to talk a little bit about King John's death because Mark's obviously mentioned that he uh, at this point has got dysentery so Um, indeed yeah so he he died on the 18th of October 1216 Um, as mentioned by Mark yeah um, King John uh, contracted dysentery and died at Newark Castle Um. Where where he contracted dysentery is hard to say, but basically anywhere where you've got a lot of people laying stagnant with limited access to cleanliness, uh, cleanliness and clean water, aka pretty much any siege you could mention on both sides, uh, both the defenders and the attackers, regardless of who you are, dysentery is very easy to contract. It was most likely one of his servants bringing him the food that actually had dysentery and he contacted it through the air from him um, or of course through some tainted water he was given perhaps uh, obviously it's impossible to know um, the crown passed down to his son Prince Henry and I've actually just uh, done a super quick bit of research on my notes here in 1216 uh, Prince Henry was nine years old so yes he would have been born at the time you mentioned with the uh, decisions between the barons and the pope so yeah he would have been about seven years old give or take um, at that time but yeah in 1216 he was nine years old obviously too young to rule uh, he died uh, King John died at Newark Castle so he was brought there and um, he was uh, taken to Newark Castle. Um, if you've ever been to Newark Castle, obviously you're, you're uh, into your uh, English Civil War as well, uh, history, so chances are you have been to Newark, but well, beautiful so place. Yeah, strongly recommend it. It's, it's incredible. I'd love to go back as well. Um, so, of course, Henry was too young to rule, especially during this particular tumultuous time. It would not be a wise move for anyone to put a nine-year-old in charge. Uh, It would kind of just be an an insult to the seasoned barons and obviously Prince Louis as well. Um, So most of the power actually went to the new king's regent, William Marshall. Um, Now, he was a very well-seasoned military commander. I won't touch upon him too much because I'm actually working on a video about him. Um, Mm -hmm. I need to visit a fair few more places until I can actually do his do him justice um oh. but again if mark has any information on uh, king uh, sorry on uh, william marshall we would like to share i'm more than happy for him to take the reins on that one but um so there's obviously most 
definitely changed the tide because William Marshall, unlike King John, he was seen as one of the barons. He was seen as someone who could be trusted upon. He was a veteran. Um, he was a champion. He used to love his joust and he used to um, not only take part in joust, but also host and organize them for different lords and barons across England. Um, he knew his stuff. He was well depended on and he was taken seriously, uh, unlike obviously King John had in many occasions. So William Marshall managed to largely patch things up with the barons during this time, and many barons actually switched their loyalty from Prince Louis to Henry. They had seen Louis, and they're really kind of banking on him, swiftly taken over um, Dover, and then subsequently other castles would fall to the French's reign as well. And then they're basically be in the position where they could just divvy up the responsibilities and the land between the rebellion, uh, rebellious barons. And that would pretty much be the war over once he, you know, uh, King John lost his footing. Um, but seeing that Dover Castle had prevailed uh, against Prince Louis' forces, and this was quite early on into the, um, uh, into the French's invasion, um, so a lot of barons were thinking, oh, hang on then, we made a massive, <laughs> a big mess up here. Um, so it was at that point when, as I say, King John died and William Marshall was put um, uh, in charge as kind of like Lord Protector of, um, uh, and obviously advisor of uh, King Henry. Um, by early 1217, Louis was beginning to feel the pressure, um, so he tried gaining the public's favour by besieging castles and letting defendants leave with their horses and armour. However, under the alliance of Marshall and the barons, Louis's forces were being stretched to the point of breaking. So Louis kind of, it was kind of, um, if you see of like celebrities nowadays where they have a really bad rep and then they try doing something which will gain the public's fail, uh, favour, um, I'd love to say, what's that name, Mr. Hancock? But I, I, again, I don't do modern politics. Um, for example, even in Norwich, um, there was a hospital called St. Helens, and it still stands to this day. I think it's a retirement home now. Um, but that was built in the 12th century, and a load of money was poured into it when King, uh, well, Prince Louis uh, came through and basically took control of Norwich. At this point, Norwich, like it's mainly been through history, was it was fairly, um, it was always royalist, but it was fairly submissive. It's just like, I'll do whatever, just don't damage anything while you're here, and then we'll pick up the pieces when you eventually, you know, get kicked out. Um Norwich always liked money and profit. Whatever gave them most money and profit, they'd do that. But they would never put their nose into anything, really. It, it, was, it was seen as just they were on their own, just doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I say, so when he did come over uh, to Norwich and claim ownership of the city and the castle and the cathedral, um, he didn't, you know, raise taxes in the area, steal from the coffers or anything like that. He built hospitals to try to gain people's favour. This did a certain amount, but it just it wasn't enough because, as I say, his his uh, forces were the point of being stretched to breaking point. Um, he just he was overstretched. That's that's the, the long and short of it. Now, Louis decided to retreat to France again for reinforcements, and even while marching to the south coast of England towards the French ships, he was ambushed at Luz, um, forcing him to lose even more men, which obviously did not make King Philip very happy um, and also as well damaged his chances of gaining the reinforcements and the extra injection of cash that he desperately needed to solidify his rule, his quaking rule of Britain. Um, so with, uh, with this time, so during this time, the garrison at Dover had been repeated, repeatedly attacking the French ships. Uh, while both while they were docked and while they were coming over the English Channel, uh, meaning that communication between Louis's army and uh, France had all effectively been broken at this point. Um, King Louis's army besieging Dover Castle had been destroyed by the English um, under the rule of, I think it was Herbert, wasn't it? Um, again, just scrolling up to make sure I got my notes correctly. Um, yeah, Herbert de, de Beer, Hubert de Beer, sorry. And um, so obviously he was a well-seasoned soldier as well. And it was actually at this point that King Louis 
uh, sorry, Prince, I keep calling him King Louis, uh, Prince Louis, he was, he was quite ballsy. He, he sent a letter to, um, uh, to the defender, the, the uh, military leader of Dover Castle, uh, De Bure, uh, basically saying that, you know, I have your kids, I have your wife, you will give the castle over to me, you will give me the keys to the castle and open the gates to my men, uh, or he, they will die and you will die as well. And Herbert basically just replied saying, no. And that was it. Just just a simple, no, yeah. that's not going to happen. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, do that. I am loyal to William Marshall and obviously uh, King Henry. Um, so again, this you can see at this point how desperate Louis was. You know, he was building hospitals and you know letting people go free while sending private letters to English lords um, and defenders. Uh, military masterminds, etc., saying, you know, I am going to torture and kill your loved ones and family. Whether he did actually have uh, the family, uh, uh, De Beers' family, we don't know. I suspect not, because obviously when you're defending a castle, it's very limited the information you can get in that castle. He would have been kind of in isolation, you know, with the Wi-Fi off, so to speak, not knowing what's going on out in the outside world. So it was, again, it was very ballsy for De Bure to basically say no and decline him because he must have known, I assume, that you know Louis was bluffing. Uh, he wasn't telling the truth. Um, so the siege diverted so much of Louis's men. Uh, but William Marshall took the opportunity, seeing how strained they were at this point, uh, to besiege Louis's stronghold at Lincoln and London. Uh, effectively uprooting the last of the French's influence over England, because again, obviously Lincoln was with Lincoln Cathedral as a major religious hub where a lot of bishops would congregate and discuss plans. And then simultaneously, London was a big military area. And obviously there were, you know, uh, effective politicians who could um, make rules, etc., and send certain letters um, across Britain and get certain things done. So with besieging Lincoln and besieging um, London, uh, again, Prince Louis just it went from bad to worse for him. His influence over England was pretty much diminished uh, just over a two short years of uh, his invasion, or even less than two years, really just one year. Um, then what summed up that as well, so it was the his defeat by the sea. So things went from bad to worse for Louis, So uh, who inevitably, he lost the siege of Dover, for a second time. He retreated back to his ships as he did before in the hopes to flee back to France, but unfortunately the English were already waiting for him. This just goes to show how well organised that William Marshall was. Um, you know, he just took the reins. He was obviously been lo looking very closely at the campaign that was ongoing and he already had a plan and he knew the people to help him execute the plan as well. Um, so under the leadership of who had um, Hubert de Bure, who was again defending uh, Dover at this time. Um, so he successfully defended uh, Dover Castle in the first siege and uh, the second siege as well. And then the English defeated the French at sea um, with Louis's army just completely gone. It was just his campaign was in tatters at this point. Uh, he surrendered the remaining captured castles that he had just because there was no point in defending anything at this point he, he, he had gone basically he had failed uh, and he was forced to promise um uh, kind of sign a treaty to promise not to attack in england under his reign again uh once he became successor and uh was well, successor to the throne of um of france yeah and and again so you um you you um talk about this medieval naval battle which basically ends the Barons' Wars in the end, doesn't it? But um, also, I want to just quickly bring Mark in as well, just to say, um, yeah, so so the ba the Barons themselves, they actually switch allegiance, don't they, from um, sort of like, well, they're not really with Prince Louis, are they? But they, they switch their allegiance to Henry, don't they? And so that also causes Prince Louis a problem as well. Is that right? Yeah, well... They switch allegiances to William Marshall in reality. Yeah. Henry, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. He Henry's nine years old. William Marshall is known as Queen England's greatest knight. He serves five kings, I believe. It is, it's, it's four or five at least. 
um, that he serves and he's instrumental in gaining back power and also defeating the French. Obviously, it culminates in this Navy battle, but whilst William, uh, whilst Louis is involved at Dover, he, as Alex said, he attacks the counter perch at um, Lincoln and destroys the army there. So by all accounts, he gives a speech that's equivalent to the one that William Shakespeare wrote for Henry V. Um, in, and then when he charged, he his initial charge, he ended up three lances deep inside the French lines. So he he didn't mess it. He, he's a strong military leader. He's brave in battle. And I think a mixture of one, him, himself being a baron and being, being Lord Protector Regent. Also, he's just false of character. This is the person that has one of the mainstays behind the Plantagenet rule in England. So he, he served Henry II at his side. He has a little bit of a flip during the Great War. Um, the one minute is between Henry II and Henry the Young King. That might be where the fifth one comes from because he, he was crowned at that point. Um, is one of the... He serves Richard. He serves... We, we've seen that he was all, he was instrumental in the crowning of John over over Arthur. Um, he then becomes the region, and so he's very instrumental in bringing the barons round. So, like you say, when when the barons are declaring for Henry over Louis, it's more that they're de they're, they're declaring for William Marshall over over Henry. And to the most part, but also because they probably believed that although Louis was a better option than John, if you've got a young boy that's king and he's being schooled by a very able regent that is a baron, they probably think that they can sort of mould him into someone more meaningful for the barons. Mm -hmm. Come the come the come the point of maturity and. As we know from history, and we go on to the Second Baron's War, he's cut from the same cloth as his father more than anyone else. Um, he signed, he has another, he instigates another Baron's War because he regains again on the treaties of, Mag of Magna Carta, which lead to him eventually signing the provisions of Oxford. Um, and so, and yet his greatest legacy is actually his, his son, who is Ed, uh, Prince Edward, who becomes Edward the First. So yeah. he, in terms of actually his he's not gonna be a strong king, he's not got this fault, he's not got a force of character that sort of everyone would look at in the same way that when his king king kingship is starting to fall apart, everyone sees this warrior son that he's got that's sort of in the shining light and hope for the future. He wasn't that for John, and so when when John dies and sort of the Baron starts switching allegiances, it is more down to the the regent more than the king. Yeah, and I mean the country must have been an absolute mess because not only have you got a civil war going on, you've also been invaded by the French, and they're going around, uh, you know, sieging castles as well as King John doing the same thing. This country must, uh, during that period, must have been an absolute mess, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Um, obviously, you've had a number of a number of them. You've had the anarchy um, at the end of the reign of Henry the First, when Stephen, the barons again, they remain on a treat on an oath face war that would place the Empress Matilda as queen and replace him with Stephen, um, that leads to a 20-year civil war. That's ended with Henry II coming to the throne. Then you have the Great War between Henry and his children. Um, that take, Although most of the fighting takes place in France with that, the Scots do invade, and there's a lot of power politics in terms of castle 
castle being besieged and sieged and who's got what. Then you get this. So it's not, yes, the country will be in a mess, but it's something that's sort of quite a common occurrence okay, at this okay. point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not yeah. looking back on it now where sort of we've had a, in this country internally, it's been stable since 1745. Yeah. You know, um, whereas, so it, so we can look back on it now and say, and say, it must have been a mess, it must have been this, it must have been that. But actually, when you look at it, it's kind of happening every sort of 50 years or so. Yeah, yeah. If less than that. So So the people are used to it, I suppose, in a way, I'll tell you, you know, in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't that national identity isn't such a big thing at this point, I don't believe. Um, so it's more about not quite to the extent of local warlords, but you would if you're a local if you're a lo- a local peasant, it didn't matter who the king was, it mattered who your lord was, and then it they decide. Yeah. So it yeah, it I think that yes, it would have been a mess that you had rampaging armies all over the place barons going left right and centre but it, it, in the medieval period it was a lot more common yeah. than, than, than than we okay than, than we, we think about it today and again I'll bring you back in again Alex because obviously the last battle is the Battle of Sandwich as you said it's a naval battle but what's, what I find interesting about it is a naval battle when you think of a naval battle you think of cannons and them shooting the hell out of each other um, but this is a medieval naval battle, and I and I don't really know much about a medieval naval battle. So tell us a little bit of, and explain a little bit about how that would unfold. Yeah, I mean um, the details of this specific battle, uh, I'm, I'll admit I'm not too clued up on. I'm, I, yeah. I'm not, but as you see, there's so many avenues to go down. Yeah, um, it's quite difficult. However, I believe there is uh, there is a YouTube video that I can link you from uh, YouTube that I watch. I'll see if I can find it after this and uh, link yeah. it in the chat. But I think he actually does like a full talk about like every single aspect of the the naval battle, and he's even got little props for you to see as well. Yeah, so yeah, a little bit more. Yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can find it. Um, but in general, I mean, naval battles they weren't a huge thing during the, the uh, specifically the early and high medieval period simply because the technology kind of hadn't caught on it was all about castle building it was all about sieges during this time um naval battles really kind of came into their own earlier um so they're still using pretty much the same tactics as they were um even going back as you know early roman times and even before then to be fair where you basically you'd um you try to put your ships in a strategic area, like a causeway, uh, defending a port um, near some shallow area. Um, it was you pretty much just use your ships to defend an area and block it off, rather than to engage in warfare. Um, for example, you've got during the Hundred Years' War where there was uh, a lot of places like Calais, for example, where. Um, ships were pretty much just anchors. They were just put as blockades just to stop any other ships from going in because you'd just throw some fire on whatever ship t- came too close to you and um, obviously just sink it and or cause a lot of damage. Now, with the battle of uh, the naval battle of Sandwich, what you've got is you've actually got knights, uh, well, usually just soldiers, men-at-arms, um, a lot of archers. You'd have a, a lot of archers and javelin um uh, javelin throwers, skirmishers, etc. Um, you'd even have uh, how are they called? Um, I can't remember the name now. Uh, rock throwers. What we what we call them? Slingers. Slingers. There you go. You'd even have slingers. Even in the medieval period, you'd still have slingers because they were just useful. They were just like little snipers. You know, just taking out people, conquering them in the heads. Especially in a naval battle, where generally you got quite close to your uh, your opponent. They were kind of they would sail their ship. Uh, or row their ship, I should say, because to get that kind of accuracy, you can't rely on the wind. You'd need to basically row to get where you wanted to. You would probably maybe ram into them, but usually you would uh, kind of park up and anchor side by side, and then you would put over the planks of uh, wood as the boarding uh, to board the enemy um, ship, and then you would just have a normal 
like you know a normal guerrilla warfare style battle um but just on these planks of uh, between two ships it would have not been a nice environment um you would have not ever wanted to fight a naval uh, battle just because it was so difficult you needed armor to defend yourself you needed to be strapped into these shields etc you need to uh, wield these swords and these spears and you needed to have the helmets and all them obviously at the time quite male throughout my youtube uh, and my instagram i'm always saying how armor is not as heavy as you think chain mail is heavy uh, you don't feel that it's quite heavy but again i i wear full chain mail on my early medieval and high medieval um reenactment kits but uh you don't really feel it but you would do if you were plummeted in ice cold water wearing it yeah. uh, because not only that you've then got the woolen padding as well underneath that soaks up and that becomes a lot more heavy when it's exposed to water and when it's just it's basically like a sponge it just so there's going to be a lot of people drowning then basically if you fall out you're you're done <laughs> yeah and not only that as well you've got people falling on people as well you're, yeah you're, you're slippery people are going to try to climb back on the boat so they're just going to create everything just so wet and it, it sounds absolutely awful I mean, uh, oh, again, I wouldn't want to be involved in a medieval battle on land, let alone sea now. I mean, crikey, no, you know? No, it, I'd much prefer one on land, to be fair. Oh, and wow. even then as well, you've got... Um, oh. So, I have these... Um, uh, I have reenactment, a historically accurate um, 11th to 13th century shoes, which you would have wore with the rest of your armour, etc. And there's no grip or anything. So they were made to go over like fields and cobblestones and stuff like that. They weren't made to go on wet planks of wood and wet floorboards. You'd just be slipping and sliding oh, all over. Yeah. So as soon as you got in the water, you're done for. You just got kind of got a kneel <laughs> or yeah. just take your shoes off and fight barefoot pretty much to give you a bit more grip. You're just, you're just being slipping and sliding all over the place. Um, People do talk a lot about having um, fire arrows. Fire arrows are apparently very useful in naval warfare. Again, you try putting some tinder, uh, tinder or kindling on an arrowhead and fire it, uh, it's not going to happen. It's going to extinguish as soon as you let that bow go. You don't, uh, sorry, that, that arrow go. You don't even need a particularly uh, high powered bow uh, for it to extinguish, just the act of it alone. Um, that's just going to go out pretty much straight away. They used to have their, um, they used to have specifically made uh, kind of caged arrow tips, where it's essentially like a little uh, cage of twisted raw iron metal as the arrowhead. So you weren't going to penetrate people. I mean, you could, but it's not going to do as much damage. It's going to be kind of blunt force impact. Well, what they were doing here, they were aiming at for the sails. They were aiming at to just get caught in like the castle, the wooden castle they used to have on the back of these ships. Um, but yeah, as I say, so fire would definitely be uh, a part, but the issue with fire is if you're parked uh, side by side uh, against an enemy ship, your rigging and your sails are going to be intertwined and all not adapt with theirs. If you set their ship on fire, chances are yours is going to be set on fire as well. So yeah. Yeah, fire seems like a great thing to do on you know, naval warfare, but it's kamikaze. Um, you are just endangering yourself just as much. I mean, you know, okay, you've sunk the ship. What's next? Your ship is now on fire and you're anchored down and half of your men who you used to actually sail the ship are now dead in the water. You know, it's, it's, you've got to think about how you're getting out of the situation rather than just how to defeat the enemy. But I thought that's another thing to consider with naval warfare as well so it used to usually just be you're two anchored up and you're just firing uh, you know you're just uh, unloading arrows um into each other and they didn't have like, all the decks that you'd have they had some decks but they didn't have like all the, the loads of decks you could just hide out with at the time and ships were a lot smaller during this time as well than the kind of mary rose style ships that you see during the later medieval period the renaissance of tudors etc um so it would have been smaller scale usually but even then i do hear of massive numbers of ships i mean sometimes 80 ships I don't. It's it's impossible to visualize eighty flagships all in one small area, kind of just bustled up against each other, rammed into each other, entwined uh, the sails amongst each other, and people fighting. You know, just going from board to board, kind of thing. Um, 
that yeah, that would be quite difficult. And yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, if, if, really thinking about it. If we're looking at sandwich though, you're looking at quite a major quite a major port at the time. So yeah, of course, yeah. You, you're probably looking as a not necessarily flagships or what would have been created as warships, but you probably would have just had the local boats going out with armoured our men on it and things like that just to boost the numbers wouldn't you it's... yeah yeah definitely a lot of rowboats definitely because i say i mean you'd have the large ships basically acting as floating fortresses and you would just have loads of rowboats just kind of churning men over and over and over again because you know people can't fight for hours on end you'd have maybe fight for 15 minutes and then in a normal battlefield You'd fight for 15 minutes. You'd then make your way to the back of the line uh, where all the like the vassals were and the people who could have the servants. You'd have your water, you'd have some food, you'd take your helmet off, have a breather, have a little bit of a cool down, and then go back in the fray. You can't really do that in a ship. So they'd have mm -hmm. rowboats on the opposite side of a ship, if possible, where you would then scale down into, maybe even go, you know, spend some time on land for a little bit, uh, cool down and then in rotation you just keep you know re-entering the fight so to speak um yeah. that takes a lot longer than walking to the end of the battlefield and taking your helmet off so yeah. even then the, the, the logistics of it all must have been almost yeah impossible. yeah people right. don't think about logistics of anything do they but that's really cool thanks for giving us insight to that and um just quickly while we finish up the actual um the topic and uh, Alex, in a minute, I'll, I'll talk to you about your pages quickly, if you wouldn't mind. But Mark, can you just tell us where you can actually see um, Magna Carta? Because you can see it, can't you, nowadays? Uh, the You can see original copies as well, I believe. Some where... original copies did around, right, it went into mass production immediately right. afterwards. Yeah. So whether or not that one that was originally stamped by King Jordan is still around, I don't. I don't know for certain. Um, there were certainly contemporary copies about. Uh, I know that there's one at the British Library. Mm -hmm. um, and some cathedrals have them, but I'm not 100% sure. I, 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 I was under the impression Salisbury Cathedral had a copy. Salisbury's got one. Um, yeah. uh, Lincoln's got, I don't know if it's the original page or it's a copy of the page, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. um yeah I've, I've seen that in the um yeah I, I, i've only seen the one at the british library so but and again oh. going back to its importance um from what i understand the 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 american constitution is actually you know drawn from parts of magna carta in a way from what i understand so it, it, it just proves how important this document is uh through history it would be because the provisions of Oxford, which is the next one on, which actually lays down more stipulations and actually is sort of, if one document is to say this is the birth of democracy, it's probably more a provision of Oxford than the, than the Magna right. Carta. Okay, cool. That, that was put down as a legal document of governance, whereas I said earlier, this is a peace treaty. Yeah, okay. Um, but because since then there's a difference between what the document was made to do when it was initially written to what people, historians looking back on it, have given it. Mm -hmm. To come 1780. 1780s when the American Constitution was written the idea that the Magna Carta was the document that birthed democracy in England would have already have been put in place Yeah. so yeah. it would have lent certain aspects to it so yes we need to weigh up that kind of thing. What was it? There's a difference between what was it at the time and what is it in history. And what it was in the time wasn't what we today see it as, but that doesn't diminish its importance to either. Okay, cool. 
Okay, um, Alex, um, so let's talk about your pages, uh, mate, because you're doing an amazing job. You've got an Instagram page and a YouTube channel, haven't you? And you've both got, you know, they're doing really, really well. Um, you know, um, your videos are, are fantastic. So would you like to tell everyone a little bit about what you're about and what you actually do? Yeah, of course, of course. Thank you. Um, yeah, so obviously they're just passion projects. It's not my main job. Uh, my main job is actually going to be changing, and you should actually see that in the upcoming months uh, on my YouTube channel. Um, so basically, uh, I, I use my social media for different things. I don't own uh, normal social media. I've never been interested in it. I deleted all my social media accounts when I was 16, the day I left school. Um, it's just not interested me, unfortunately. Um but um, so they're all used for different things. I have three. I have the YouTube, I have the Instagram, and as of recently, I've actually um, taken the dive and uh, made a TikTok account as well. Exactly. With... Okay, I'll come find you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll send you a link to it later. Yeah. Um, with so the Instagram came first. Um, I use the Instagram account because. I obviously I, I go around uh, my my main hobby is going around to different historic sites and areas of interest and kind of painting a picture of the history mainly of Britain. I mean I I, I don't really I I would say I, I'd like to go around to foreign places that's for sure, but that'd be for different reasons. Uh, pretty uh, pretty much I love going around Britain for the historic sites. That's my ideal holiday. You know, uh, waking up six a.m. seven a.m getting on the backpack, hiking around to different places, getting a train and just exploring as many places as I can, ticking off all the historic sites, all the castles, etc. Because, it re again, I think it really does kind of paint a picture of your history and especially your local history. A lot of my pictures are from the local area. I mean, we've got hundreds of medieval ruins and earlier uh, of just, you know, stones throw from my house. So it makes sense to, you know... Um, mm go through them all and take pictures. You will notice there's a theme uh, on my Instagram account where I kind of like to take it from a little bit of a different pers uh, perspective. Uh, I love all like gothic stuff and dark stuff as well. So you get so many Instagram accounts, which are great in their own right, where they do literally just, they just get the entire castle in frame or they get an entire cathedral in frame, a church in frame and just take a picture of it and post it. Fair enough. With me, I like going around to all the different angles uh, to try to find like comes something a bit more magical, a bit more mystical about the site. Um, I edit uh, I edit all photos myself as well. It's not just a CPO. I, I do all other stuff in the background as well, just to you know kind of get the light and right to make it look quite dark and gothic. Um, it, it's just a different point of view, you know. It's just so you can see what I'm looking for when I go around all these ruins. Um, so I do two pictures of architecture, and every third picture is some reenactment kit that either I've done or a reenactor that I've uh, looked at, and also I give them a mention as well. Um, so all pictures are taken by myself and edited by myself, um, as you'll see in my bio on my Instagram account. And, uh, yeah, I'll continue to do that as a little passion project. And then I've got my YouTube, where I put by far the majority of my effort into um, where I like to take, again, from my travels, I, when researching these places and buying the books and et cetera, these, all these uh, places I visit, I really like to look into very niche histories, a lot of myth busting as well, as, you know, I, as I've alluded to in this uh, podcast here. Um, I've taken, there's been a few things associated with King John that I've said, well, actually, technically, this isn't true. This is a real thing, or this is how that fact came to be, or this is how that myth came to be. This is the origin of it. Um, that's pretty much what I do uh, with my YouTube. I do that, reenactment, talk about uh, military campaigns. Um, I also like to talk a lot about medieval religion because, as I said before, the more I study medieval religion in Britain or the practice of Christianity, the more I realise not people weren't as religious as people think they were in name, yes, definitely, but religion played a much different ro uh, role in Britain during the medieval period. Religion basically acted kind of as the local council would. You know, uh, you want a school being built, you want a hospital to uh, have more uh, people taking care of you, you wanted some bridges to be built, you wanted a new tavern, you wanted uh, some uh, roads to be repaired 
Who do you go to nowadays? You go to the council. Who do you go to back then? You go to the church. That's what they would, that's the role they uh, played. That's why you had things like the tithe, you know, because it was tax. It was basically their version of the council tax. Um, so it's kind of just kind of trying to put people's mind over to a different perspective of medieval Britain and finding the answers of why they acted these certain ways rather than just they acted like this, just believe it and move on. Um, so they're the two main ones. And then, again, with the TikTok account, I, I don't use TikTok. I don't like it, but... I did find this quite a good way to capture an audience where I only post my reenactment stuff. So reenactment fighting, looking at really cool armor, uh, especially cavalry. Cavalry is always quite a popular thing on TikTok, apparently. Um, I don't search anything. I don't watch any videos on it. I don't follow anyone, and I never will do. Um, but I have found that between Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok, TikTok just definitely gets more viewership. And it's amazing how many questions and actual um, talking points I get. People engage with me and ask me certain questions. And I'm like, oh, that'd make a really good video. Bear with me on that one. I'm, I'll <laughs> think about it and you know, research it, put it on my YouTube channel, let you know when I'm done. Um, so that's pretty much just what I use it for. TikTok is very visual. It's just you know getting people's attention, looking at people fighting in armor, historically accurate armor, rather than the silly movie stuff that you see so easily. Yeah, yeah. Trying to educate people on that. The Instagram is mainly for the architecture and the kind of the gothic aesthetic and the feeling that I get when I visit these places. Um, and then the YouTube is as educational as I can get. You know, there's no you know skits or anything really. It's just this is what I found, and this is the images imagery to go with it from the places I visited, kind of thing. Yeah. So um, yeah, and um, they're all called Alex the History guy as well. If you put it in with either yeah. underscore or without and, underscore, uh, you'll I'll find put it. the links in the description below so people can find you. And uh, honestly, um, mate, uh, what you're doing is great. So uh, yeah, brilliant stuff. And uh, all that's left to say, guys, is thank you for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure, and. Uh, yeah, hopefully we'll sit down and talk again soon. Yeah, we'll do. Yeah, happy to. Definitely, it's been a pleasure. Okay, see you all soon. Goodbye. Yeah. Cheers, bye.